and he did his MBBS and MD from Stanley Medical College, and subsequently worked in PhD Medical College in medicine for three years. Later, he joined the PBS Institute of Dietary Diseases, Kochi, and worked under Dr. Philip Agustin, Dr. Matthew Philip, and Dr. Jane Ramesh for two years. At that time, I had also joined PBS after my DM, and we were together for some time in the 90s. And uh, Dr. Venkat was very energetic and focused, and had a great passion for gastroenterology and hepatology. In those pre-internet days, he used to get me copies of rare hepatology and endoscopy books, and I still cherish them. Dr. Venkat did his DM from CMC Belur in 1999, and had obtained his DNB in the same year. He started the Department of Medical Gastroenterology at PSG Medical College in 1999. And he obtained the ESG Fellowship in Advanced Therapeutic Pancreatic Biliary Endotherapy in 2007 at Ramis Medical Center in Brussels under Professor Jack Devier. He obtained the Fellowship in Transplant Hepatology at Hospital Paul Brosse in Paris under Professor Didi Samuel and Professor Henry Bismuth. He started the DM program in PhD Medical College in 2009, and liver transplantation was started in 2014 at PhD. He had published 39 papers in various national. I thank Dr. Vagis and the Kerala Society of uh, Kerala chapter of the Indian Society of Gastroenterology for having given me another opportunity to discuss a recent advance in hepatology. Uh, can I have the next slide? I think in 2020, before we discuss the recent uh, uh, recent advance in hepatology, the most landmark thing which happened was the, the three scientists, uh, Harvey J. Alter, Michael Hooten, and Charles M. Rice were awarded the Nobel Prize for discovery of hepatitis, hepatitis C. I think that's a landmark uh, event in the annals of hepatology in the world. But they discovered hepatitis C. And the discovery of hepatitis C uh, rapidly solved many issues. It also led the hepatologists to think about the evolution and progression of fibrosis. And at the same time, one of the most landmark discoveries, one of the most landmark discoveries of the drugs has been after HIV, has been to cure hepatitis C with the oral uh, direct antivirals. Following this, uh, we are able to achieve cure in a section of hepatitis C. And I think by 2030, as the WHO proposes, we should be able to eradicate and minimize hepatitis C. Can I have the next slide, please? The first thing I want to discuss is a new hypothesis, which has been uh, put forward by Visanta Aro, a group from Barcelona, about what drives a decompensation and a multi organ failure in cirrhosis. If you look at cirrhosis, cirrhosis is a multi model progression. The three events which will decompense, uh, which uh, heralds the decompensation is jaundice. GI bleeding, ascites, and encephalopathy. Most important is ascites, GI bleeding, and hepatic encephalopathy. It is always thought that ascites is because of portal hypertension, and it was thought that because of the activation of the renin angiosystem system, there was an increased sodium absorption, ascites was forming. Gastrointestinal bleeding was also thought to be a, a forerunner due to portal hypertension. And hepatic encephalopathy was a direct uh, cytotoxic, cytotoxicity of the ammonia. It has been shown that the bacterial infections was uh, one of the more major events which can push a patient to have GI bleeding or hepatic encephalopathy or kidney injury. It was thought there were three different events which will always produce a decompensation. But in a landmark study by the Vicenta Aroya group, Paolo Angeli from Italy, uh, Richard Morrow and Rajiv Jalan's group have shown that what, formation, what forms the, what drives this 
decompensation into a multi organ failure is nothing but a systemic inflammation which is going on on all sides the systemic inflammation could occur either due to a bacterial infection but they have shown that systemic inflammation can worsen ascites can worsen gi bleed can worsen portal hypertension it can worsen a hepatic encephalopathy so a single uh, hypothetical model of saying that instead of three different uh, the different uh, causes of ascites gi bleed and hepatic encephalopathy there is a single single uh, driving force as of as of systemic inflammation hypothesis can i get the next slide this slide shows what drives the systemic inflammation it is known that cirrhotic patients do have increased sibo and also increased permeability of the of the intestinal mucosa because of that they give the tight junctions uh, give way and when there is increased permeability there is increased cytokine response and the cytokines which are always present or which drives this systemic inflammation are il6 nitric oxide tnf il il17 and and interferon gamma and it has been shown that even in the in this, the the second slide the the the, the 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 graph shows that in a patient who has got a compensated cirrhosis there was there are always ups and downs or flares of these cytokines and when these cytokines reach a point of a, a reach beyond a threshold point this compensated cirrhosis becomes acute acutely decompensated so this is what they have sold that because of the cytokines there is a lot of lps there is a lot of pamps and dams and these produce cytokines so it has been shown that in when you measure the il6 there is always an increase and decrease of il6 in patients even with compensated cirrhosis when these systemic uh, these cytokines reach a threshold point they drive the patient to develop ascites gi bleeding and encephalopathy thereby thereby producing a decompensated to a, a decompensated state to a uh for uh, compensated to decompensated it has also been shown that in patients who develop ascites and patients who develop gi bleeding in the even in the absence of infection there is an increasing bacterial dna products in the blood during the time when that patient develops ascites or gi bleed so this is what they proposed saying that there is a single hypothesis of a systemic inflammation being driven to produce three important events of decompensation like ascites hepatic encephalopathy and and a gi bleed more than that it has also been shown that when these bacterial dnas are going up there is always a progression to acute kidney acute kidney injury so you can develop acute kidney injury and when these cytokines keep increasing from the acute kidney injury the systemic inflammation will push the patient into acute kidney disease and from acute kidney disease they go into they go in into chronic kidney disease so these are the variables which they said because of the single bacterial translocation increased cytokines it will enhance and even and a, a persistent increase in cytokines drives the a compensated cirrhosis to decompensation can i have the next slide so this shows that this slide shows that a patient will have a st stable decompensated state he can become unstable decompensated state he can go into pre aclf what do we mean by pre this is in time where a patient from acute decompensation goes to aclf how do you differentiate predominantly when a patient has got a t stable decompensated state he goes to aclf predominantly what differentiates is the presence of one two or three organ failure three organ failure and mortality here in a stable decompensated state a 90 day mortality may be close to about 
one year mortality may be close to about 15 to 30, 10, 5 to 15 percent. But the differentiation between an SDC and an ASLF3 or ASL2 is high mortality, high mortality. So they said that ACLFS may not be a completely a different entity, but it is nothing but progression of the systemic inflammatory uh, drive, which drives from an acute decompensation to an unstable decompensation to pre-ACLF and then they go and a severe form of system inflammation is ACL. So now they have hypothesized that in a cirrhosis, there is a stable decompensated state. There is an unstable decompensate because of a decompensate event like a bleed or an encephalopathy and there is a pre-ACLF state. What and if, when it goes into a very severe systemic inflammation, then they develop ACLF and ACLF is recognized by the presence of organ failure. And in a patient who has an acute decompensation, will have a, a six month or one year mortality of nearly 15%. Whereas a patient who has an ACLF has got a very high 90 day or mortality. So they have now proposed a hypothesis that the stages of cirrhosis can be one compensated cirrhosis, stable decompensated state, ascites or anything, but they don't progress, they don't have an in-hospital infection or they don't die. Patient going to pre-ACLF state where there's severe, severe forms of encephalopathy or bacterial infection, but they don't have an organ failure. And otherwise, once they develop an organ failure, they name it as ACLF 1, 2, and 3. Can I have the next slide? So now the def they define acute decompensation is defined as acute development ascites, encephalopathy, gastrointestinal bleeding, back injury, or any combination of these complications. Back infection may precipitate or constitute a part of the AD. But the most important thing is they do not really have organ failure or they do not really have a major mortality and they can get reversed. Can I have the next slide? Can I have the next slide? But there's one more slide before this, please. There's one more slide before this. Whereas, whereas, so, can I have the next slide, please? So, if you are going to say that, no, no, just a previous slide, Dr. Sojan, previous slide. So, now they say there is acute decompensation. It could be either, then we call it as stable decompensated cirrhosis, where there is no ACLF, no death during hospitalization, no rehospitalization within three months. Unstable is no ACLF, but death during hospitalization. Pre-ACLF is no organ failure proven to ACLF. And AD with ACLF is with organ failure. Grade 1 is one organ failure, grade 2 is two organ failure, grade 3, 3 is three organ failure. So now they have proposed a hypothesis that we need to change the nomenclature, acute decompensation, acute decompensation with no ACLF phenotype. So acute decompensation can be stable decompensation, unstable decompensation or pre-ACLF. And or you have uh, AD with ACLF type where it could be either single organ, say two organs or three organs. Can I have the next slide? It has been shown, so they have proposed that albumin treatment down regulates systemic inflammation in the decompensated cirrhosis. Systemic inflammation is a major driver of progression from compensated to decompensated cirrhosis. Once the first episode of acute decomp develops, systemic inflammation follows a chronic course where you will be able to reverse this course with interventions like treating hepatitis B, treating hepatitis C, abstinence and treating alcoholic hepatitis or treating infections. But ACLF is an extreme expression of severe systemic inflammation. So what this particular group is driving is, what this particular driving is that uh, uh, integrating all the, all the uh, events of decompensation into a, a single hypothesis of systemic inflammation hypothesis 
and starting with acute decompensation, pre-ACLF, and later it becomes ACLF. So I think this is basically taken up both by the canonic study and the predict study, and now they have hypothesis this one. This is what has been is the, one of the landmark studies which has come, which has come in March 2021. This is a good study which was taken up by uh, Paolo Angeli's group. Can I have the next slide? Next slide, please. In hepatitis C, I have taken two articles. Can I have the slide? So then the next slide. We know that the incidence and prevalence of HCV infection, woman of childbearing age and pregnancy have increased. And in US, it has been shown that younger women in pregnancy have a large amount of hepatitis C. Even though the incidence all over the world is about 0.9%, there is a steady increase in hepatitis C in younger pregnant women because of injection and drug abuse. And we have not really, and pregnancy, and majority of these, 85% of these patients, younger patients, who are pregnant of hepatitis C, have a very high viral load. And we do not know the incidence of mother to child of HCV transmission. It may not be adequately described because once a child is born, we have not really followed other children up to three years of age. There are many countries which do not have a guidelines how to test a child born to a HCV mother with a high viral load. Other than HIV suppression, if a patient, it is always said that if a patient is HCV and HIV, HCV and HIV positive, the transmission to maternal trial transmission is very high. But we know in a patient who is not HIV positive, the transmission of HCV to a child is about 5.9%. And uh, other than HIV suppression in a patient, we have, there are no intervention to decrease the risk of MTCT of HCV. Can I have the next slide? We know that the incidence of HCV in a pregnant woman ranges anywhere from 0.3% to 3.9%. In Italy, it is about 3.9%. In Asia, it is about, seen to be about 0.9%, but 87% are viremic. In Africa, it is about 4.6%. And in Brazil, it is about 0.1%. And in some other countries, it is about 7%. So it has been shown that these patients are highly viremic. And it has been shown that hepatitis C maternal to transmission, maternal transmission to maternal to child transmission can occur in utero, perinatal, and postpartum. But most commonly, it occurs in perinatal and postmortem. And we have we need to have a correct testing for the child who is born to a mother who has got a high thing. We need to check his birth. We need to, earliest time for testing HCV should be at two months. Then 18 months. It is recommended to test the HCV antibody to establish MTCT. And these children had to be followed up for three years uh, for HCV RNA testing uh, for those who are po antibody positive in 18 months. And that is the earliest time you can start treating HCV in children. Unfortunately, in all the countries, only 11% of children who are born to HCV positive mothers are found or tested at the age of three years. So we need a big. What is the implication? The implication is we are doing a major community transmission of hepatitis C when these children go untested and we need and we do not uh, we don't find. So the WHO goal of eradicating 2030 hepatitis C will go in vain. So this is something which all the guidelines should follow according to WHO. And is there any maternal problem with HCV? HCV in pregnancy is associated with preterm birth, fetal morbidity, fetal death, and most importantly, intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy. And universal screening of hepatitis C is supported by the Center for Disease Control and shown to be very cost-effective. Can I have the next slide? But 
we have the guidelines which show that we don't deserve the guidelines to show that show that there is no evidence to treat DAA during pregnancy. So what are the pros and so should we treat mothers with hepatitis C positive with a fifth DA? The pros is the maternal cure while engaged in pregnancy care. You'll be able to cure the mother during pregnancy. There may be a possible decrease in MTCT, decrease in community transmission and potential decrease in HCV-associated adverse pregnancy outcomes. The human safety in pregnancy is not established. Safety during breastfeed is not established. Difficult in accessing DN therapy and cost of it is not established. But there are three studies, can I, no, no, please. There are three studies which are now used. One is Pittsburgh, one from Italy, and another, there's also one study from India, which showed, which, in pay, after doing the gestational rats, treating sofosbuvir plus velpatasavir, grisbuvir and pirimbetasavir have been used. And in three human studies, about 12 patients in each of the study were pregnant women were treated with these drugs and they found adequate safety. They found that the uh, we do not know if the MTCT has been, MTCT has been prevented but at least the cure for the mother has agreed and the children are to be still be followed up. So there is, at least we have a data to say that it, the sofosbuvir based regimens seem to be have a safety profile and we may have to consider treating these patients, treating these patients uh, with antivirus. This is what the proposal has come to you with this. So this is a recent, uh, there are what is called as thematic mini-series on uh, hepatitis C. And this is a recent publication which said, look, the Pittsburgh says, clearly says there is a safety profile and breastfeeding also has been saved. But these children are yet to be followed up to 18 months and three years. So in future, probably we'll have some guideline to say that it is safe to treat via patients with hepatitis C, um, with DAA. Can I have the next slide? The other recent paper which had come is HCV surveillance after SVR in patients with F3 and F4 fibrosis. We do have uh, a surveillance model. We don't have a surveillance score, a uh, hepatitis C risk score for both for hepatitis B. You have the TRIS index called the Toronto IHC index. You have the PAGE index for hepatitis B so that you can predict HCC in these patients. We know that patients after reaching SVR in hepatitis C can always develop liver cell cancer. Then there are some differences in the ASLD and ESLD. Can, we, can I have the next slide? Patients eradication, patients eradication reduces but does not eliminate the HCC series. Whenever there is a CVR, a patient has achieved SVR or a cure, it definitely reduces the risk of HCC because it uh, brings down the epigenetic potential of the carcinogenesis in hepatitis C. It is also known that the fibrosis comes down. And this call also prevent HCC. But at the same time, patients who have got cirrhosis of liver require HCV server indefinitely after SVR. Why does HCV eradication reduce HCC risk? It is because there are certain changes. It reduces the fibrosis. It reduces the stellate cell activation. It reduces the collagen matrix. It reduces... As a fibrosis, it reduces the epigenetic potential of the carcinogenicity and HCC. But at the same time, there will always be a residual risk for HCC after HCV eradication. And what are those risk factors? Can I have the next slide? If a patient is in advanced pyrosis or you give an antiviral achieved SVR, 
there are two things which can happen. You can have a fibrosis resolution. When you have fibrosis resolution, there is no new related is it genetic or epigenetic preneoplastic changes. So you may not develop HCC. But there will be at least about 20 to 25 percent of patients who will have either F3 fibrosis, which can persist. And the persistence can be due to alcohol, NASH or age, or the persistence can be due to the, the initial fibrosis itself can be very huge. And this can lead on to genetic and epigenetic preneoplastic changes. So how do, we, how do we calculate the risk factors? How do we look at predict the risk in this particular group in pain? So long we didn't have the risk factors and now they have proposed a risk of HCC. Can I have the next slide? So the easel recommends that anybody with F3 or F4 should undergo, recommend, should undergo HCC surveillance. ASLD says you do it only for patients who have got cirrhosis. This includes ultrasound every six months. This includes ultrasound plus AFP six months, but they don't recommend for F3. How do you recommend uh, define F3? One, you can do histological. The fibro scan shows 10 to 13 kilopascals. The RF shows your velocity is more than 2.17 and HCV surveillance is, is recommended. In uh, definite cirrhosis clinical, histological, Fibro scan is more than 13 pa, RF is more than 2.7, FIP4 is more than 2, 3.25, and APRI is more than 2. This is cirrhosis, this is F3. Let us go on. Let's can I have the next slide? So now there are three important. This is a very, very difficult uh, uh, predictive model because we will not be able to get the 24 laboratory tests. But the three important simplified HCC scoring, that is called the FIP score, elastography based on the fibro scan, and there is a multi veteran, veteran affairs HCC model, which has shown to very, very accurately predict the risk of HCC. So if the, if the, if the, if this is the FIP score, which is based on age, ASL, plate can count. If in elastography has been shown, if your LSM is more than 15 kPa, you are liver stiffness more than 15 kPa, you have a chance of developing HCC. If it is more than 22, the chance, the chance of HCC is very, very stiff. In this, this thing, they looked at the SVR, age, sex, BMI, race, everything, and they put a, a score model. On a simple FIP score, they looked at the annual HCC inflations in patients who are, saying, who are on F3 fibrosis, uh, who are of cirrhosis and patients who were not no cirrhosis. And they found that the, if the FIP score is more than 3.25, 3.25 in a patient with cirrhosis after SVR, your chance of incidence of cirrhosis is 5.64. So if your FIP score is always more than 3.25, your incidence of delivery is 5 to 6%. Look at this. We always thought that in HCC cannot produce, uh, is not produced in hepatitis, in due to hep C, in, in non-serotic hepatitis C. But in a patient who has got no treatment, treated cirrhosis, if your FIP quantity is all 25, you still have 3% chance of developing cirrhosis. So the two models which I said is, you combine a regular six monthly FIP4 uh, estimation along with elastography, even if a patient has got no treatment reverses, there is a, at least a 2.9% risk of developing HCC in these patients. And what drives these, these patients is associated NAFL and alcohol in this particular group. Can we have the next slide? So, so HCC risk in, HC, in HCV is one of the most important factors that to inform decisions on whether how to screen for HCC. So now they have proposed that a regular FIP4 estimation check along with a fibro scan in a cirrhotic 
and if it is always persisted about 3.25 annual incidence is about 5.6% despite having an svr if you do not have a pre treatment cirrhosis but your fit 4 is elevated which could have been driven by a nash or by an alcohol your chance of developing hcc is 2.9% so these are the two indicators which now they have proposed as one of the hepatitis c risk indices for patients who have achieved svr can i have the next slide so when your patient is you assess the hcc predictor use the fit 4 elastography a time biomarkers and you have a model if a high risk you have to do an abbreviated mri if it is a medium risk it is a biomarker biomarker ultrasound very low risk no surveillance low risk biomarker parameters and here they have mentioned what is called as abbreviated mri so if a patient has got a persistent thing do we now the proposed this thing is do we do ultrasound abdomen or an abbreviated mri abbreviated mri is a single dynamite contrast enhanced imaging in an mri if you want to do a complete mri it's a very costly so they compared should we use ultrasound abdomen or abbreviated mri and they found can i have the next slide this is a study which came from pgi chandigarh can i have the next slide that if you do an abbreviated mri as been suggested to ultrasound and complete mri screening so 15 studies and 28 2008 was 9 and 17 sensitivity of abbreviated mr is higher for detection of hcc less than 2 cm than ultrasound if the lesion is less than 2 cm detecting a hcc is better with amri and amri and abbreviated mr is higher per patient and high and higher per lesion detection during screening so two things we get the we get information from this particular study is if a patient's fit for score and your lsm is going to be persistently high in a cirrhotic you have a 6% chance of annual occurrence of hcc despite svr even if the patient has got f1 f2 or f3 f3 fibrosis or even in a normal hepatitis if your fit for score which could have been driven by a nash or thing it could your response you are still you have a hcc of hcc of 2.9% combined with an lsm of a fibro scan kp of more than 15 or, or 19 you have a very high risk of this thing if it is a high risk patient the screening is probably they propose preferred by an abbreviated mri than an ultrasound because an abbreviated mri has got a much higher sensitivity of picking up a, a smaller lesion than an ultrasound abdomen can i go to the next slide <laughs> coming up again again to the cirrhosis we know that we had one what is called the answer study what does the answer study show the answer study showed the long term albumin administration administration improves the survival and prevents occurrence of major complication of patients with cirrhosis and ascites it prevented encephalopathy it prevented bacterial infection and it prevented acute kidney injury but nobody knew what is the what is the end point of albumin we should we should we should get it what is the end point of uh, albumin uh, what what is the end point of the albumin at what albumin level you think you will you will get a good report this particular study which came again uh, from the italian group showed that human albumin effaced the relationship between a baseline serum and mortality it is shown that a patient has got ascites if your serum albumin is low baseline thing your mortality is high it has been shown that when you give 14 week continuous therapy therapy of albumin in these patients and if you can reach an albumin of 4.1 the mortality certainly comes and they said probably now the hypothesis of filling the albumin gap Uh, once you reach 4.1 you will be you should be able to reduce the mortality and reduce the complications does an alb baseline valve will determine what is it no 
any albumin value even if it is 3 just by giving albumin and by if you reach a baseline of 4 it helps but even when you don't reach a 4 baseline of 4 it albumin albumin infusion certainly helps to reduce the mortality in a patient with ascites this is just a lay summary on a completion or or a small offshoot from the answer study so what it shows is that okay that's it this is over can i go to the next slide the other recent development which has come as come in autoimmune hepatitis we know that in autoimmune hepatitis steroids and azathioprine are the hallmark or they are the standard treatment in fact the response the response to steroids and azathioprine can be taken as a diagnostic diagnostic criteria for autoimmune hepatitis 90% patients will respond to steroids 10 to 15 percent patient will not respond to steroids and what do we do tam this is a recent european positions european autoimmunity group position statement which was led by professor agnes losa who did who has done a phenomenal work in autoimmune hepatitis the key points are patients with ahi require alternatives alternatives to standard immunosuppressive treatment in two clinical scenarios one you can have insufficient response that is not achieving remission or intolerance due to side effects so long nobody defined what is a biochemical what is a remission biochemical remission of age is defined as normal transaminases what do we mean by normal transaminases sgot below 30 sgp2 below 23 and alveolar normal igg levels what is your cutoff of igg levels below 12 and if you do a histology histological remission the hepatitis active index should be less than 3 out of 18 but 10 to 15% of the patients will not come with this classical response and what is the duration you will say that there is no response after 6 months of treatment if the patient does not normalize as uh, transaminases or the igg level does not come below 12 it is called it is no remission there is no remission this is all so 6 months is a cut off point so once you have a insufficient response what do you do so predominantly these patients are put on steroid and other thing they respond we just continue the treatment if there's insufficient response at the end of 6 months always the first line is you check the azathioprine metabolite this is the first step we should always do if the azathioprine metabolite 6 tgn is less than 20 less than 220 either patient is not compliant either we increase the dosage or you add 100 mg of allopurinol plus low dose of azathioprine this should save this but if your tgn is more than 2020 and patient is still insufficient response you need to first rule out alternative diagnosis what are the two alternative diagnosis you will rule out in these patients the two alternative diagnoses you will rule out in these two patients are associated pbc and psc you don't look only for ama m2 but you also look at gp220 antigen in these patients to make sure that there is no associated pbc or psc psc of course you would have done a initial biopsy at but and you should relook at the biopsy to do it. so re exclude alternative diagnoses the second thing you need to know is you need to know as sometimes azathioprine toxicity can also produce reductive will also delay the response so these are three things which we look at re exclude alternative diagnosis and look for azathioprine type toxicity once you uh, you have this uh, re exclude diagnosis you intensify the therapy you can either go on up on steroids or you can increase the azathioprine and if you have response is good if it's insufficient response you go to third line of drugs can i go to next slide 
For AI to patients not achieving remission under standard treatment, optimization of azathioprine dosage on the basis of 6 TG11 should be a first before starting alternative immunosuppressants. Can I have the next slide? That's a key message. Occasionally, patients will not tolerate azathioprine. So, if it is insufficient intolerance, you can give 6 mercaptopurin. If they are still intolerant, if you think, you can give mycophenolate mofitel. Mycophenolate mofitel can be given up to 2 grams a day. And if there's a response, you continue mycophenolate mofitel. If it is they are intolerant, go to the third line of treatment. Can I go to the next slide? 6 mectoporin or mycophenolate or the treatment of choice for A patients who are intolerant to standard treatment. Can I have the next slide? The third thing is, if you are intolerant third line, and what are the present drugs available? The third drugs, one is tacrolimus, you have cyclosporin, you have infliximab, rituximab, methotrexate, cyclosphosmide, and you can also use uh, evorlimus. Evorlimus. Now, evorlimus, <coughs> evorlimus has also been has also been now advised to be used. We sometimes go and use tacrolimus in these patients and cyclophosphamide. So the, the European position statement on this says, look for uh, azathioprine TGN metabolites, less add allopurinol, high alternate diagnosis be excluded, modify the standard regimen, not anything, then you go to third line. If they are intolerant, use mycophenolate bofetal, if you um, sorry, six MP in microfilter, otherwise you go to third line, third line treatment. The problem with the third line is quite a few drugs we don't have data in children, and that is what I say. So, this is the latest European position statement which has come in 2020. Can I have the next slide? So, ultimate uh, algorithm they say is steroids by azathioprine, insufficient response, azathioprine metabolites, re exclude alternate intensify therapy. Intolerance, 6 MP in mycophenolate. Intolerance, go to third line treatment. Can I have the next slide? So that is the age thing. This is a short uh, evidence-based review which came in uh, hepatology in 2020 November. Uh, can I have the next slide? Not many of us give a uh, problem to, uh, we have thought about these plural effusions. Uh, in patients with cirrhosis. Hepatic hydrothorax is present is a, is a presentation of pleural effusion of patient with cirrhosis without evidence of other cardiopulmonary disease. There should not be cirrhotic cardiomyopathy. There should not be left ventricular dysfunction. The most important thing of hepatic hydrothorax is it heralds a high mortality. Patients who got hepatic hydrothorax have 25% more chances of acute kidney injury 40% chance of HE, 40% chance of septic, septic shock and a very high incidence of mortality. And if they develop spontaneous bacteria empyema, the mortality is close to 60%. The management will require reduction of ascites, fluid transfer, pleural space, obliterated pleural space and liver transplantation. So many things has been proposed. But the guidance says the two things we can do is initially you can use sodium and salt restriction, you can use diuretics. You can also use vasoconstrictors because it has been shown it is a portal hypertension which drives the fluid from the ascites into the stomach because of defects in the diaphragm. Defects in the diaphragm. And we can use vasoconstrictors like octreotide to reduce the hepatic hydrothorax. Removal of chlorofluoridate, what are the data says? Using a pleural tube. Uh -huh. Okay, rural uh, thing. Okay, uh, using a plural tube. Plural tube. We it has been shown that it increases infection and mortality. Thoracocentesis is best, but the two best, the best option in these patients would be tips, or we should push it to a, a liver transplantation. The plural tubes have contributed to a major infection these patients. So the present guidance says either you use a medical management or early tips or you go for a liver transplantation. That is, a, that is effective 
message in this hepatic hydrotech guidance from ASN. Can we have a next slide? This year, we had seen COVID-19 and the liver. Can I have the first slide? So we know the COVID-19 is a pandemic caused by SARS, a virus that has 80% homology with SARS COVID. The angiotensin convert is a host cell disruptor of SARS CoV-2. It is a present in type 2 alveolar cells, gastrointestinal tract, and the liver. In addition to droplets, SARS COT also transmits through fecal overloading. It has been shown that 2 to 11 percent of the COVID-19 have been reported to have underlying chronic liver disease, which the study came from China. 14 to 53 percent of patients with COVID-19 have been reported to develop some form of hepatic dysfunction. Can we have the next slide? There are many studies which has come from China and it has been shown in USA and Italy that patients had higher ALT and AST in diseased patients, high mortality in patients with acute liver injury. And most of these patients had a comorbidity of diabetes hypertension. 7% of patients with COVID-19 had underlying chronic liver disease, 3.9% also and mortality of 4.3. So at least about 3.9 to 7 percent of COVID-19 patients had underlying chronic liver disease. And patients who had a chronic underlying disease, mortality was 44.3 percent. If the COVID was very, very severe, the mortality was close to about 15 patients. And it has been shown that patients who had abnormal LFT had longer stay hospital and higher AST and ALT and gamma GT was patients with severe disease and patients with NAFLD uh, and along with diabetes, had severe COVID-19 disease. Uh, in some studies, uh, whenever the patients died of ARDS, patient had a very high bilirubin. And when there is a high bilirubin and uh, ARDS, the mortality was close to 30%. In USA, at least 14.7% of patients developed acute liver injury. So this is the uh, view of this thing. Uh, other issues in COVID, patients with HCC, generally the guidelines, the easel guidelines said, don't treat them with uh, either local regional therapies or postpone the treatment till the COVID pandemic ends, number one. Number two, you can give regular vaccination for patients with HCC. Number three, if the patients are immune checkpoint inhibitors, it has to be stopped when they have developed COVID in these patients. Major, uh, majority of the patients with decomposite chronic liver disease with COVID had very severe infections. And as I told you, when they had ARDS and high bilirubin levels, the mortality was close to about 19%. COVID also affected the liver transplantation patients. The what they did during liver transplantation patients, milder COVID did not alter the graft response, but it has been shown that we need to bring down the immunosuppression levels in these patients. Tacrolimus was reduced in these patients and the level of tacrolimus was maintained between 8 to 10 at this point of time. So they reduced the tacrolimus levels. When uh, there was only, there was one day in one particular article, there were two deaths in patients who had liver transplantation and especially when they are admitted with ARDS. Patients who were obese and had NAFLD had very severe COVID disease and COVID along with diabetes Whenever they had MAFLD, had a very severe disease. What the easel has given a position statement on how do you vaccinate patients? Patients with chronic liver disease can get vaccinated. They can vac get vaccinated uh, like any other flu uh, with four weeks apart. They have given four weeks apart. Can post liver transplant patients can get vaccinated? Yes, the safety profile of patients with COVID or post liver transplant was pretty good. Except in if the vaccine which was developed by one company, it was very highly immuno, immunogenic, some of the patients developed uh, cellular rejection in these patients. But the Moderna vaccine, which was administered to most of the liver transplant patients and the AstraZeneca thing, did not had a safety profile in liver transplant patients. But if the patients react with a lot of immunogenicity, there is a small chance of cellular, cellular uh, rejection 
in these patients. These are the issues of COVID and liver in 2020. Can we have the next slide? This is what is called as a uh, hepatology snapshot, uh, which produce, which has given us a, a short gist of what do we do with uh, primary skeletal cholangitis. They call it a six C's. One is covered. The PSC affects all ages and it can present with covered symptoms. They can come only with fatigability. They can come with mild uh, abdominal pain. They can develop with pruritus. The cause of it can be genetic, epigenetic, environment, and there is also increased expression of the HLA receptors in biliary There is also the role of gut liver axis and immune response. The PSC IBD is phenotypically mostly ulcerative colitis, commonly occurs in the right side, and it also shows increased preferential malignant transformation in these patients. The cure of it has to be a very holistic approach. We need can we can give UDCA, or if the patient program has goes in for a cirrhosis, then they require transplantation. The risk of <coughs> cancer is high due to cholangiocarcinoma, <coughs> which in any patient, if there is a sudden increase in jaundice, we, and if there is a sudden increase in CA99, we need to rule out intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. And how do we do the surveillance in patients with, uh, with IBD? After detection of PSC and IBD, every year we need to do a colonic cancer surveillance in these patients. So therapy can be microbiota based, immune modulating, amphrodite thing, and liver transplantation. So you have six C's. Presentation is a covert presentation, causes, pathogenesis, associated colitis. How do we tend to cure this? The presence of cirrhosis and, and surveillance for cancer risk and PSC cerebral cancer risk. This is a hepatology snapshot, which has now been uh, has been has just been published recently. Can I have the next slide? Okay. Can I have the next slide? The present uh, the problem with alcoholic use disorder or ALD represents an ever increasing burden, not only in US but also in India. Alcohol abstinence remains the most important factor in survival of ALD. And there's a broad agreement for incorporating AAU treatment. The problem is, as physicians, we never incorporate treatment of alcohol use disorder on ALD. We don't call addictologists or the psychiatrists to give us a thing. The current treatment options of alcohol abuse remains limited only to corticosteroids and an early liver transplantation. There's no other drug which has been. Recently, they said there is a combination of steroids, steroid, and Steroid as well as NAC. Could it help or something? But these are things. Uh, but a better understanding of pathophysiology of alcohol has been has led to several new targets for therapies, including gut liver access, anti-inflammatory drugs, antioxidant drugs, everything. The problem with steroids is it shows that there is a 28-day decrease in mortality, but it does not reduce the six-month day mortality. And it also shows that corticosteroids can drive these patients to infections. And we know in alcoholic hepatitis there is an immune, immune paralysis, and that can lead on to that can lead on to a bacterial infections even without steroid therapy. The important thing we need to do is we know that alcohol abstinence is only is the important thing that has been shown by Patrick Louvé that if we maintain alcohol abstinence, abstinence. After the first epidose of alcoholic hepatitis and you recover, you reduce the mortality in these patients. But it has never been incorporated. And the first message this article gives, which comes in current OB in gastroenterology, says it is always for the physician that we need to incorporate treatment of alcohol use disorder to alcoholic hepatitis. And we need to now think out of box, again from steroids, or early liver transplantation. Liver transplantation fails a life-saving treatment. And the recent John Hopkins study shows that if the patient can come out of a liver, come through without a scathing infection during a liver transplantation, 
the survival is close to 90% in first year and at the end of five years is 81%. So it's very, very good. But the, uh, but the problem for us is we do not know if the patient goes back to the thing. So the, the three-month abstinence rule or six-month abstinence rule has been taken off. And now they do recommend that for severe alcoholic hepatitis, unresponsive steroid, that means the LIL score is more than 0 0.45 at the end of one week, you need to consider transplant in these patients. The problem of liver transplant with alcoholic hepatitis is severe post-transplant infection, especially fungal. So in our center, we always start antifungals from the day one after liver transplant for alcoholic hepatitis. Can I have the next slide? So there are many things which can cause alcohol, we can drive alcohol. You have pro-inflammatory kinds, and most important is abstinence. You have the increased gut microbiome. So, so we can use the gut liver axis to reduce the oxidative stress. And it has been shown that there are a lot of other drugs which are being used as not yet been guided, but has been used in treatment with alcoholic hepatitis. Let us see what are their drugs. Can I have the next slide, please? Next slide. Dr. Sajan. Next slide. No, there's one more slide before this, Sajan. After this, one more slide. Is uh, actually, just, no, no, no. Okay. Then now, what are the. Okay, next. Can, can you put on that slide? Okay. So. Now, they use the gut liver axis. So, they have used to reduce the, uh, the gut, uh, to reduce the translocation of the bacteria, to reduce oxidative rest. They have used antibiotics. It has been shown that amoxicillin and clavulinic acid can be used. Probiotics have no use. There has been some, some results with fecal transplant through orally. That has been one thing is thought of. And N-acetylcysteine can be used along with steroids. Embryic acid has been shown to reduce decompensation with alcohol hepatitis. It has not been shown to reduce the mortality. And then nowadays, you can use some of these TNF inhibitors and this um, selenoceptin and this uh, some of these uh, anti-inflammatory agents can also be used. And it's been on a trial. The other trial has been with bovine cholesterol and it has been shown to have some benefit but it has not reduced the mortality. The regenerative agents which has been used are IL-22 and GCSF. So these are some of the novel agents which are in phase 2 or phase 3 trial for alcoholic hepatitis. And they let us see how we can probably reduce the mortality in these patients. Can I have the next slide? Can we use statins for treatment of chronic liver disease? This has been a long study, earlier study, where it has been shown that, initially it has been shown that the statins were harmful for the liver. And again, there was a very uh, uh, a seminal paper from in New England Journal, statins do not harm the patient. But now again, the interest in statins have come back. The, initially, there was a lot of work on statin on portal hypertension, which reduced the portal hypertension. But there are off, on the last four years, there are a few studies uh, by Kamal, and the best study had come from Mohammed Siddiqui's group from Arun Sanyal group, who showed that when you use statin in patients who have got non alcoholic fatty liver disease or patients have got NASH without dyslipidemia, it still reduces the mortality due to cardiovascular and cerebrovascular stroke. In, Incidence and it also reduces the progression to cirrhosis. So this is one particular study where you may, it is recommended to use statins in patients with NAFLD or NASH without dyslipidemia or a metabolic syndrome. Number one. The second study, which came again from the Isha Kamal, Kamal's group, which showed in patients who had liver cirrhosis, especially in hepatitis C. Uh, statin appeared to delay the progression of hepatic fibrosis, prevent hepatic decompensation, reduce all-cause mortality. Uh, there's one more study which came with, this is again due to hepatitis C. Most of these studies are hepatitis C. In hepatitis C, it has been shown that when you use statins, they reduce the hepatic portal venous pressure in short-term treatment 
and patients benefit from a long term review most of the studies have been used simvastatin but these studies these three studies were using atorvastatin so it has been shown that there is a renewed interest of using statin in chronic liver disease even though simvastatin has been shown to be shown to reduce in earlier studies now atorvastatin has been recommended in treated treat patients with nash and nafold to reduce the death due to cardiovascular and cerebrovascular mortality as well as progression to cirrhosis in patients who have got cirrhosis especially with hepatitis c statins are known to reduce their portal uh, the hepatic venous gradient and progression of cirrhosis so in in future they say we may have to include in our, our prescription the statins when patients are in well compensated cirrhosis there's one study which shows that it may improve decompensating even but there's only one study and we don't have major idea on these things and it has all been shown that statins are generally safe in patients who have got well compensated cirrhosis also i think that's my last slide so i have taken you through uh, these are all the studies which has been shown by using ah, the other thing the statins have shown is a reduction in hepatocellular carcinoma except Prevastatin, atorvastatin has shown that there is a definite decrease in patients who got HCC. One is most of these patients are treat, treatments have come from Taiwan, where HBV treated patients who who have undergone who are on or on nukes were given statins and they found that there is a decrease in HCC. So these are few studies which show. So it reduces the onward progression as well as the progression of into hepatocellular carcinoma so we may have to the hypothesis we may have to incorporate statins in nafold in patients who are compensated so especially hep c and is also known to is also shown to reduce the incidence of hcc in these patients i think this is my last study so i have shown you a new hypothesis of systemic inflammation driving compensated to decompensated and there's a whole spectrum going to pre aclf and aclf i have shown you the safety of hepatitis c drugs in pregnancy i have shown you that we need to probably we have a new hcc risk index in patients who have attained svr i have shown you this guidance on hepatic hydrothorax what we need to do uh, the other thing i showed you was what is the european position statement on the management of patients with autoimmune hepatitis who are intolerant or inadequate response i told you briefly about the povit and liver as well as the position statement of vaccination and this thing the other thing about that is can a patient of covid who dies can be transplant the liver can we take the organs the thing is no we don't know what it is so we said they said we will not be able to do a disease donor transplant in a patient who dies of covid pneumonia so that has been stated and also the guidelines how do you vaccinate these patients even in liver transplant and the recent novel treatments of alcoholic hepatitis starting from bovine colostrum to anti inflammatory and using and suppressing the gut axis uh, gut axis and we should always incorporate the treatment of alcohol use disorder with a psychiatrist or uh, addict, uh, or an addictologist to prevent the progression of alcoholic hepatitis and probably the new prescriptions which may require which we may have to require statins in using in chronic liver disease thank you thank you professor venkat krishna for the recent exhaustive and a talk on hepatology all the recent aspects of hepatology we have covered more than 10 talk 10 subjects and it is very very uh, interesting and it is an enlightening for all of us uh, in the chat box i think jayanti madam had asked a few questions in the chat box yes robert uh, dr robert please uh, ask those questions i just see the chat okay what makes uh, junction leaky in cirrhosis uh, that is a uh, intercellular junction leak in, in the uh, intestine uh, dr bagi professor bagi some say what rises that inflammation which is thing that has been shown that uh, the what did the leak we have seen that the cyclic amp levels increase when there was an intestinal dysbiosis 
and that is supposed to cause the leak. Uh, That's what they postulate. Nobody knows. Okay, Professor Jayanti has asked another question. How will you differentiate acute decompensation from ACLF? That's what I said. Acute decompensation will not have an organ failure. So you have a stable decompensation where patients do not die and they survive after three months after acute decompensation. Unstable is they will not have organ failure, but they may can die during the hospital or within three months. Then the pre-ACLF, it's a very safe systemic inflammation, is very high. We don't define it. But once they develop an organ failure, either it will be ACLF1 if there's one organ failure, ACLF2, it is uh, it is two, it is two organ failure, and three is organ failure. Can we transplant these patients? Yes. ACLF3 also can undergo a transplant, provided they are not on respiratory support. Okay, most of the patients who do come to us, they do have more than one organ failure. Yes, yes, we do have. But what they are trying to, there's a new hypothesis that we were telling acute decomposition is different than ACLF. But what they drove was that there is a single systemic inflammation which was going on. That's a beautiful study which showed the IL-6 is always elevated even in a compensated cirrhosis. And you can see it in graph, there are sometimes IL-6 goes up, comes down, goes up, comes down over a period of 12 weeks. So sometimes there's one trigger which can decompensate these patients. So they said because of this uh, bacterial overgrowth and translocation, the eye, the inflammatory markers are always elevated in these patients. And what it drives is, in that article, I didn't have time to explain. They could explain the ascites, they can explain the acute kidney injury, they could explain the encephalopathy, they could explain the GI bleed based on the systemic inflammation. The clinical situation, um, say in a day-to-day -day practice by the by the bedside, Madam? by the bedside, can you come to a conclusion that this is acute decompensation versus ACLF bedside? That's what what they're saying is even you have acute decompensation. The, the one thing different is the mortality. Even you have an acute decompensation stable. I showed you your six-month mortality, one-year mortality is only fifteen percent. But the moment you develop organ failure. It goes up to 30 to 70 percent. <clears throat> Dr. Uh, Robert, there are some more uh, comments. Uh, can you? Can you? Are inflammatory markers? I think Dr. Jaydeep has asked. Inflammatory markers different in various stages. Various stages of alcoholic alcohol No, the, the two inflammatory markers they studied was IL-6 and CRP. They didn't do. They don't look. They don't look at many things. They also looked at the there's other thing like a neutrophil burst response during inflammation. But what they looked at is two markers. One is IL-6 and CRP. That's what they looked at. But does it differ in the various stages, MBK? Like pre-ACL? Does it differ in the various so What they have seen is when a patient who, is, uh, who has got a very well compensed cirrhosis and is going into decompensation, the IL-6 levels are much higher than a patient who is in a compensated cirrhosis. As they are going, the IL-6 keeps going up much before the event. So that is what you can probably predict. That's what they say. Yeah, Natural history of newborn acquires HCV infection. See, the point here is we don't have data because nobody has followed the children in the third year of life. It, it is now mandatory that a, a child born to a mother who has got uh, a high HCV viral load, check at two months, check at 18 months, and check at three years. The problem there, what they say, the CDC says is, we don't have the data on children. So at, at three years, if they are highly viremic, you can treat, but you can't treat them before three years. They don't have any guidelines. No, but do you think they progress to... They become viremic. That's what they said. At three years, they become, they are still viremic. 85 to 87% of children can be viremic if they have acquired the infection. But the acquiring of infection is 5.6%. In HIV, it is about 7 to 9%. Even if they acquire the infection, does it change the natural history? Suppose the child moves up to age of 15, then you treat them at that age. We don't have details on that, does yeah. it? Yeah, what I'm saying is... So that is what I'm saying. We are missing that, uh, that the target population. So it is important you trace the children and check again at three years, at 18 months and three years. 
So in the absence of hard data, the recommendation is to check at two months. Check at 18 months and three years. Months and three years. Yeah. And at three years, if the child is viremic, then start treatment. What happens if you hold on? Hold on for 10. I mean, nothing will happen to the child anyway. At three years, it was shown DA is pretty safe. Uh, natural uh, biomarkers, HCC, there were 24 panel biomarkers, man. There, there was... Too many Bible. I think clinically it is very difficult to use it. That was only a proposal. But what was interesting was that abbreviated MRI. That is what, and this is a very interesting paper which came from PGI Chandigarh. Interesting. Yeah. Where you do a single thing and say probably that if you bring down the cost, maybe for a patient who's got a high risk score, a FIP4 of 3.4, 4, 5, you can do an abbreviated MRI. Yes, sir. Somebody asked about obiticol colic acid in NASH. Obitic colic acid in NASH is uh, is not given for everybody in NASH. The recommendation for, from the, the FDA is recommended only in patients who have undergone a biopsy and if you have ballooning, you can give this one and if you have stage 1 or stage 2 fibrosis. The idea is that the ballooning should disappear and you should be able to downgrade the fibros by stage 1. Uh, this obitocolic acid was the the FDA actually came down on its recommendation of using obitocolic acid on their uh, on their uh, uh, final score points. Actually, they descended down and they said, if you have ballooning and this thing, and if you are able to reduce the ballooning, or if you are able to downstay the fibrosis to stage by one grade, you can use. Uh, that's how they uh, approved obitocolic acid in these patients. In the answer trial, the argument was gay uh, or was it? Uh, but Dani's paper, no? The albumin, what was the dosage daily? daily 40 daily? grams per week, ma'am. 40 per week, no? 40 per yeah. yeah. week. Answer study. They said that now uh, you can, you start at any level. If patients are ascitic and cirrhotic and they are transolic. Somebody has said, hey, there's no study in any gym. I need to go through this. But this is, uh, again, an Italian group which showed that at least it reduced the AKI and uh, infections in these patients and probably you can bridge them to a transplant. My own experience is that when you are given it for about 7-8 weeks, uh, patients have done well. And they have now said at 4.1, probably you will have a better results and you can reach that area. But even patients who do not reach that 4.1, still they had some benefit. So this is uh, an offshoot from this answer study. It's 40 grams, you give it as 20 twice a week or would you give? You can give 40 grams per day. Uh, and one, show, one shot you can give. One shot, yeah? Safe. Yes. Safe. Mm -hmm. Professor Bengarishan, uh, your transplant, you said transplant for an acute alcohol hepatitis in your center? Acute alcohol hepatitis, yes, sir. If the patient is not responding to steroids, I think now there's a, there is an indication of transplant. We have given up that six-month abstinence rule, but it's mandatory that when you put this patient on transplant, you get a psychiatric opinion. Uh, only then, uh, if it is a live-related, uh, the panel approves it. And with acute alcoholic hepatitis, the results are pretty good. The Both Philip Mathurin's study, as well as now John Hopkins has done the maximum uh, alcoholic hepatitis transplants, 81.1% five-year survival and 90% one-year survival, out of which only 2% have again had recidivism. Only 2%. Only 2%. After 760 days, only 2% had recidivism. So, even though uh, patients do drink before that, after liver transplant, they seem to be more responsible of not going back to drinking, number one. Number two, the only problem with alcoholic hepatitis is they have a very high incidence of fungal infections. And uh, we need to start antifungals much earlier. At least in our center, we start antifungals on the day one if you do for alcoholic hepatitis. Any other faculty wants to add on anything? Uh, we have, a, uh, interestingly, a lot of faculty also attending. Today's meeting was blessed by the presence of uh, Professor Raghuram. He was there initially. Uh, and, of course, almost all senior faculty from Kerala are also here. And I think the faculty is uh, equal or more interested than the students to update the knowledge. You don't get time to read. It's a nice to update. 
Yeah, of course. It is important to update your knowledge. So, Dr. Robert? I think no further chat, no further questions in the chat box. I think, thank you, Dr. Venkatakrishnan, for the exquisite talk. Very exhaustive, like very, very enjoyable. And, and I, I, I updates on all the aspects of the pathology. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Venkatakrishnan and uh, Dr. Robert Panikkal uh, uh, for this session.